Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome both to those who are here in the room on campus at CTU and also all of you who are joining us remotely. We're so delighted to see you here this afternoon. I'm Sister Barbara Reed, President of Catholic Theological Union, and it is my very great pleasure to welcome you to this, our 23rd annual Tolton Lecture. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, the Augustus Tolton Pastoral Ministry Program began in 1990 as a collaborative effort between CTU and the Archdiocese of Chicago to offer full tuition scholarships to Black Catholic ministers in the Archdiocese and to equip them with theological degrees and formation pertinent to the particular needs of the Black Catholic community. CTU is unique in the field of theological education, offering classes in Black theology, Black spirituality, as well as a certificate in Black theology and ministry. The Tolton program is named for Father Augustus Tolton, the first Black American priest in the US, whose cause for canonization was introduced by Cardinal George in 2010. He remains an inspiration, not only for our own Tolton scholars, but for all at CTU and beyond. It's also so good to see so many of the Tolton graduates, Tolton scholars and graduates here, both online and in person. The purpose of the Tolton lecture is to recognize and acknowledge Black Catholic theological, historical, and cultural scholarship and to provide an arena for the sharing of this research and scholarship with the community at Catholic Theological Union, as well as with the broader church. It is a particular delight to welcome one of our own graduates as this year's lecturer. I would now like to invite Dr. Kimberly Lymore, director of the Augustus Tolton Pastoral Ministry Program to introduce Father Maurice Nutt. Amen. Thank you all for coming and thank you on, that are all on Zoom. I, I saw about 45 people um, before I came up here and it's like, oh, okay, we almost have more people on Zoom than we do in the house. But I'm sure people will start, you know, wandering in and, you know, 430 is kind of that awkward time. So again, I welcome you on behalf of the Augustus Tolton Pastoral Ministry Program to our, our lecture. It has been, um, it's our 23rd. And, and we haven't been in person since 2020 uh, due to the pandemic. And so it's so good to, to be back in person again, uh, you know, because sometimes it kind of loses something when you're not in community and, and can ask those questions and, and flow from each other. So, so I'm glad that we are back together again here at CTU. Uh, just to acknowledge um, some of my um, Toten alum, that have come out today. Would my Tolton alum please stand up so we can just kind of give you a hand. Thank you for coming and with us on today. I have five uh, Tolton scholars currently. Would you please stand up? So these are some hardworking men and women who are have dedicated their life to pursuing uh, ministry and wanted to go a little deeper. And so we're so glad that they uh, decided to join the Tolton program. Um, and we've been having a good time over the last few years with just, you know, what our formation, uh, which is a, a, a big component of the program. Um, so we, we are so glad that uh, they have uh, joined into ministry and that their pastors have been collaborative in the ministry too, which is always important. So I thank you uh, again, pastors that might be here that have a Tolton Scholar, so we appreciate you on today. So without further ado, so we can kind of get started. Uh, Jennifer Davis, one of the, to um, I'm sorry, Tanya Bolin, the uh, Tolton uh, scholar is going to start us off with prayer. And then Jennifer Davis is gonna come and introduce our guest lecturer today. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. 
Our beloved Father, we praise you for this event and your purpose for it. Thank you for every seat that is filled and every heart and mind that fills the presence of this room. We know that when we gather together, you always have a divine agenda, that even when we have done what you asked, the results are so much greater than we ever could have imagined. Even in failed attempts, you amaze us with your faithfulness to provide what we need. Our prayer today is that your will be done through this event. Take what we have prepared and multiply our efforts as only you can. Steer our intentions to align with your righteous will. Remind us of your faithful provision when our efforts fail us or fall short. Blanket us with your peace today. Keep us safe and guard our hearts and minds from pride and selfishness. Keep love at the forefront of our minds today and the guiding light for all we set out to accomplish and celebrate. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Reverend Dr. Maurice J. Nutt is a noted retreat, revival, and parish mission preacher. Reverend Nutt is former director of the Institute for Black Catholic Studies at Xavier University of Louisiana and a past convener of the Black Catholic Theological Symposium. Reverend Nutt wrote an award-winning biography of his mentor, Sister Thea Bowman, FSPA, titled Theo Bowman, Faithful and Free, is an associate producer of a documentary, Going Home Like a Shooting Star, Theo Bowman's Journey to Sainthood, produced by New Group Media and serves as a consultant on the cause of Sister Thea Bowman's canonization. He was inducted into the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Board of Preachers at Morehouse College in 2022. His latest book titled, Down Deep in My Soul, African-American Catholic the uh, the Theology of Preaching, Orbis Books is now available. Thank you so very much, my sister Jennifer. What a blessing it is to be in this presence, amen? The presence of the Lord, to be in the basking of the glory of God. What a singular honor it is for me to be invited once again. This is actually my second time around giving the Augustus Toten lecture. So, you know, it's always something to be proud and happy about when you get invited back. Amen. Amen. They don't have to invite you back. So I, I'm so grateful that I'm here again. I, I was uh, last here to give the Toten Lecture upon the occasion. It was a few years after earning my doctorate from Aquinas Institute of Theology in preaching. And so to come back as an alum then and to come, I had never written a book on preaching, but to come back now as an author of a groundbreaking seminal work on Black preaching from a Roman Catholic perspective. Never has there been a book written like that. To President Reed, who I am so proud to see you as president. We come back as a uh, long way back, actually. Um, Sister Dr. Reed came to CTU in 1988. I was here from 1985 to 1989. Uh, I was one of her first students. So I'm very honored to see that my one of my best teachers, and I'm not just saying that because she taught the Gospel of Luke. And Black folks love the Gospel of Luke. That's where Jesus said that he, the Spirit of the Lord, was upon him in Luke 4. And, and she taught me that it was a scripture about Jesus' concern for the poor, the Gospel of the Holy Spirit the gospel that uplifts women, especially women in ministry in the church. 
So I'm so grateful for all that you gave me. And I don't know if you all realize this is CTU. This is Sister Barbara Reed's 35th year here at CTU. Congratulations. As I prepare to give my lecture this evening, I also want to thank my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Kimberly Lymore. We go way back as well. Uh, she is now our convener of the Black Catholic Theological Symposium. She wears many hats. And I just told her, I don't know how she does it, but I'm so glad that she's obedient to God's plan for her life. And so thank you. Let's give it up for the director as well. My brothers and sisters, those here and those here virtually, let me tell you how I fell in love with preaching and especially how I fell in love with teaching preaching. I wish I could say it happened in this beautiful building, but I was a student in this beautiful building. I was across the street. And I recall one time when I was going over my homily as we watched the video with my preaching professor, Sister Kathleen Cannon, Dominican. And I remember her as she sat there explaining what I needed to improve on, what I did well. I remember kind of gazing off a little bit. And I thought, one day I want to do what she does. And then it wasn't only that, but when I went to Xavier University and to the Institute for Black Catholic Studies, I would sit at the feet of Sister Thea Bowman servant of God, Sister Thea Bowman, who taught me Black preaching. And it didn't end there because when Sister Thea passed, I remember looking down at her in her coffin at her wake and asking her, who's going to teach? Who's going to teach preaching? And if anybody, and many of you knew Thea, she said, even from her dead corpse there, you are. And it was shortly after her death that I entered into a doctorate of preaching program. And it didn't end there because at Aquinas Institute of Theology, I got to sit at the feet of Sister Joan Delaplane, Dominican. So you didn't hear me say anything about some priest. You didn't hear me say anything about a male gender. It has been women who have taught me, prepared me, loved me, and to the ministry of preaching. So I would like to just give it up to especially those three women. And as you read in my book, which you all will read because you're going to buy it, um, I talk about it. I honor those three women in the book. And I, I said, it's something about them to love the church so much that they were willing to teach men to do what they could not do at Sunday liturgy. Somebody say that's love. That's truly love for women to do that for the church, to love the church that much that they will prepare men to preach the gospel. Without further ado, I would like to address my topic for this evening, which will be rhetorical agency and the black prophetic tradition. Black theologian James Cone asserts, and I wholeheartedly concur, that the Black preacher is primarily a prophet who speaks God's truth to the people. He goes on to say, the sermon, therefore, is a prophetic oration, which is the preaching and the preacher tells it like it is, according to the divine spirit who speaks through him or her, end of quote. My brothers and sisters, I'll have you know this evening, no pillar of the African-American community has been more central to its history, social justice vision than the Black church. To be sure, there is no single Black church, just as there is no single Black religion, but, tra but traditions and faiths that fall under the umbrella of African-American religion particularly Christianity. They constitute, my brothers and sisters, two stories. One of a people defining, defining themselves in their relationship to God and the other of their journey towards freedom and equality in a land where power itself and even humanity for so long and still is, is denied them. 
Now, I'm a lecturer tonight, but I'm a preacher. So if this says something to hit you up, you, it's all right to say amen. You see, collectively, these churches make up the oldest institution created and controlled by African Americans. And they are more than simply places of worship. For Black folks, church is not a building you go to. Church is where you experience community. For Black folks, when you go to church, it's where you are affirmed in your humanity, in your dignity, in your cultural trappings. And it's also a source of justice where you go to seek social justice in a world that doesn't love you, you know you can always come to church because there's plenty good room, there is health, there's wholeness, and there's healing in the Black church. In the centuries since its birth, in the time of slavery, the Black church has stood as the foundation of Black religious, political, economic, and social life. Can I throw something on you? If you understand this, sometimes people look at us as Black Catholics and they don't understand that if we were not tethered to, that's not a good word, tethered to, we're supposed to be integral to the whole Roman Catholic Church. Somebody ought to say, well, we're supposed to be integral to the whole Roman Catholic Church. But if Roman Catholicism in and of itself, if Black Catholics was an entity unto themselves, do you know that we would be larger than the Church of God in Christ membership? Did you know we're more than Episcopalians, Lutherans, Presbyterians? In fact, we would be the fifth largest body, religious body in the Christianity in America. So even though we are small in numbers in and of ourselves, collectively, we have a tremendous representation within Black Christianity. For a people systematically bruised and debased by the inhumane system of human slavery, followed by a century of Jim Crow racism, the church provided, the Black church provided a refuge a place of racial and individual self-affirmation, of teaching and learning, of psychological and spiritual sustenance, of faith, prophetic faith and prophetic sacred rhetoric, a symbolic space where Black people, both enslaved and free, could nurture the hope of a better day and a much better tomorrow. You see, for a community disenfranchised and underserved by religious institutions established by and catering to the needs of white people, it served both secular and spiritual needs. Its music and linguistic traditions have permeated popular culture. Its scriptural devotion to ideas of liberation, equality, redemption, and authentic love have challenged and remade the nation over again and again. In fact, the Black church called the nation, America, to truly own up to where it's supposed to be, a land and a home for the free and the brave. Be who you say you are. Not only has the Black church said that, but Black Catholics have said to not only the nation, but to the church, the Roman Catholic Church. Be who you say you are. Be universal. Be inclusive. Be a place where liberty and justice prevails. That is what we are called to be about in our Black Catholic quest of inclusion and wholeness within Roman Catholicism. Over 20 years ago, upon Completing my degree in preaching, Sister Barbara, I joined the Academy of Homiletics. And I was very excited about going to my first convention of these men and women, both Protestant and Catholic, committed to the teaching of preaching. You see, I was excited because I was going to meet the likes of David Buttrix, Eugene Laurie, Ronald Allen, Evans Crawford, Henry Mitchell, Frank Thomas, James Henry Harris, 
and to reconnect with my redemptress confrere, Jim Wallace. I vividly recall that my enthusiasm was somewhat dashed as I moved into the breakout groups. It never dawned on me, my brothers and sisters, that I was the only African-American member of the Catholic Association of Teachers of Homiletics. I walked in the room and nobody looked like me. I was the only Roman Catholic member of the Black Caucus of the Academy of Homiletics. No one was Catholic like me. And at least when I was there, the white professors in the Catholic Caucus, at least they were cordial to me. But when I went into that Black Caucus meeting, a new colleague bluntly told me, or asked me, you're Black and Catholic? Everybody know Catholics don't preach. I mean, really preach. They offer homiletical observations and conversations. Well, my response to that colleague that day, and I say it to you tonight, I can't speak for all Catholic preachers, but this Black Catholic preacher preaches. The point being made that I'm making here is that as a Black and Catholic preacher with these enclaves of homiletics, I wasn't truly seen. Some ways I was possibly viewed as an anomaly at best and an oddity at worst. You see, African-American Catholics experience a double invisibility. In the Black world, we are marginalized because of there are racial identity as Catholics, and in the Catholic world, we are marginalized because of our racial and cultural identity. Yet African-American Catholics have not allowed their perceived double invisibility to deter our mission of evangelization in this church we love. Somebody ought to say amen right there. If the preacher is to preach liberation and transformation, Tom Howard, whether Protestant or Catholic, then he or she has to use language that conveys the idea and the practice of freedom. His or her language has to be bold and not timid or tepid. One cannot easily talk about freedom while using the language of oppression and injustice. Freedom has to be talked. It has to be preached. And the language has to make people feel that their freedom is at the end that they can achieve someday in their lifetime. Moreover, this language of freedom needs to be clear and precise in order to be rhetorically engaging and theologically sound. One committed to advocating and secure freedom using a language of history, expressing the hopes and aspirations, the sorrows and the agonies, the pain and the suffering of a people whose quest for freedom seems sometimes elusive, is nevertheless heard in one of the most free forms of expression in the African-American culture. What are you talking about, Father Dr. Maurice Nutt? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> it's found in the sermon. It's found in the homily. That's where Black preachers express who we are and whose we are. Our culture, we cannot disengage our Blackness from our connection with God's holy word. They come together, one and the same, to speak a word of freedom and liberation. The language of liberation is found throughout the Bible, as Sister Barbara taught me so long ago, especially in many Old Testament stories where we hear words of freedom, transformation, and liberation. From the pages of the Bible, the preacher can discover themes of freedom and liberation that need to be shared with both the church inside the church and society outside the church as we endeavor to preach the gospel. James Cone in his book, Speaking the Truth, says that in the Black tradition, preaching as prophecy essentially is telling God's story. James, James Cone elaborates, and I quote, telling the story is the essence of Black preaching. You hear people ask the question, 
Can the priest, can the preacher tell the story? It means proclaiming with appropriate rhythm and passion the connection between the Bible and the history of Black people. What has scripture to do with our life in white society and the struggle to be somebody in it? To answer that question, the preacher must be able to tell God's story so that people will experience his liberating presence in their midst, end of quote. Likewise, we all know Jesus's mission and ministry was one of liberation and transformation. Let me say that again. It must have missed somebody. That's what his mission was. That's what's his ministry, liberation and transformation. This certainly resonates with the preacher's rhetorical agency in the Black prophetic tradition. Jesus emphatically proclaimed in his preaching that the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Participation in the kingdom of God means participating in the liberating power of the teachings of Jesus as manifested in his words and in his deeds. The kingdom of God is about repentance. It's about making a change. Am I preaching to some Lenten Catholics? It's about repentance, making a change. The message of Jesus is not. It is not about maintaining the status quo. The message of Jesus is not about the same old, same old. And quite frankly, Catholics are tired of coming into their churches hearing the same rambling of the same old, same old. The message of Jesus, it demands a change in our worldview, in our understanding, and in our actions. The word of God calls and causes us to change. I need somebody out there to just shout out change. If we think today that we can hear the message of Jesus and not be transformed, there is something fundamentally wrong with your understanding of the gospel. In hearing, it should change you. In hearing, it should transform you to believe, to, to act, to move, to be motivated to do the work of Jesus in the name of Jesus. The gospel, the message of Jesus is about the process of folks changing their ways, changing their direction, changing their practices, changing their habits. The good news of Jesus is transformational and it can change the way we talk. Oh, I wish I had a witness. It changes the way we live. It can also change the way we treat one another. The Black prophetic tradition essentially seeks to morally ground a sense of justice in both personal and societal affairs. To be clear, to be Black is to experience acts of evil and sufferings quite often in our lives. It is to be in a constant fight and struggle to be seen and heard. It is to be at once enraged and hopeful. Although evil and suffering is the reality of every human and every human being has to cope with, survive and overcome the evil and suffering in their lives, let me just tell you, black suffering is distinctive and that it is grounded in the experience of being the hated other. The victim of American materialism and emerging white nationalism, black suffering, whether during slavery or in our current times, from daily killings and lynchings of black males to the nearly 40% of black youth in America who now live in poverty, embodies the negativity of evil, not just symbolically, but concretely as well. In his book, one of my favorite writers about Black preaching is James Henry Harris. And in his book, Black Suffering, Silent Pain, Hidden Hope, 
Dr. Harris confronts the pervasiveness of anti-Blackness and otherness in America and beyond. He argues that the structural inequalities in society due to injustice and racial demonstration, demonstration towards Blacks, discrimination towards Blacks and minorities are seen in the in disproportionate numbers of Black folks dying from chronic diseases. We just went through the coronavirus. No other cultural group was so harshly affected than Black folks dying of the coronavirus. This structural inequalities that were seen in the coronavirus diseases, including in cities like New York, Chicago, Detroit, and New Orleans. The problem is that the fact is of this reality doesn't seem to ever change regardless who's in the White House, who's in Congress, or who's in the governor ma governor's mansion. It appears that governments and businesses tend to be unconcerned about the blatant presence, presence of racism in every corner of the world. Black suffering is seen every day and in every place where the sun seems to shine, where the rain falls, and wherever the wind blows. And yet, some act as if racism does not exist, end of quote. While the dominant white culture may want to act as if racism doesn't exist in America, people of color do not have the luxury nor the privilege to live in such a dream world as we suffer the pain of hatred and modern day lynching. Lynching not always by hanging a strange fruit from a poplar tree, as Billie Holiday would say, but by driving, walking, jogging, selling single cigarettes outside a convenience store, just walking out of a convenience store, attending Bible study, or on a playground playing with a toy gun, sitting in the back seat of a car listening to music, standing in a garage, standing in your own backyard, at home playing video games with your nephew, at home eating a bowl of ice cream, or at home in bed asleep. Black people, beautiful Black people, all senselessly killed. If we have ears to hear and hearts to hold, there are desperate cries reverberating from the streets and the cities, both large and small throughout the world. These global cries of anguish and anger and agony are from the oppressed and those who stand in solidarity with those who suffer injustice and inequality. Just think back a few years ago. In 2020, literally the world watched the excruciating smartphone video of the apprehended 46-year-old African-American man by four Minneapolis police officers, handcuffed, face down on the ground as one of the police officers, Derek Chauvin, relentlessly pressed his knee into the neck of this Black man for nine minutes and 29 seconds. The man, George Floyd, in anguish, cried, please, I can't breathe. 27 times to no avail and became unconscious, but before becoming unconscious, like any black person, especially a black man, he cried out for his mom and ultimately died of asphyxiation. Moments after George Floyd's murder, protests have erupted, erupted globally. The protesters have been multiracial, intergenerational, indicating that they are united in their quest for justice and racial harmony. A countless number of unwarranted killings of Black people have occurred at the hands of those sworn to protect and serve our communities. Pope Francis expressing concern for this murder said, 
quote, I have witnessed with great concern the disturbing social unrest in your nation in these past days following the death of Mr. George Floyd. He went on to say, we cannot tolerate or turn a blind eye to racism and exclusion in any form and yet claim to defend the sacredness, sacredness of every human life, end of quote. That's y'all Pope, y'all. Pope Francis added that he joins the Church of St. Paul in Minneapolis and throughout the entire U.S. in praying for the repose of the soul of George Floyd and for those others who have lost their lives as a result of the sin of racism. Perhaps Pope Francis from afar understands that some and understands better than some in this country the anger and frustration of sacred black lives being so violently lost black families having to express public grief to have their black humanity acknowledged and yet racial injustice has a way of stealing black folks right to eulogize and to respectfully mourn Justice, like breath, always ought to be recognized as a human right. It should be understood by seemingly voice, the voiceless and the unheard people protesting in the streets, crying out and saying their names. Trayvon Martin, Tamar Rice, Anna Tita Jefferson, Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, Taisha Miller, Rayshard Brooks, Sandra Bland, Elton Sterling, Ahmaud Arbery, Brianna Taylor, Philando Castile, George Floyd, Deborah Danner, Deontay Wright, and the next name, when will it end? When the grief and pain of Black suffering becomes so entrenched, and there's no words left to utter, thankfully, my friend and colleague, Dr. Ernest L. Gibson III, Associate Professor of English and Co-Director of Afro-American Studies at Auburn University, provides the words that must be spoken. He says, and I quote, America's greatest reckoning has always been and will continue to be its relationship to blackness. This country's struggle, or more precisely, its unwillingness to resolve, make amends, or atone for its history of and contemporary commitment to anti-black violence is rooted in the very core of its national identity. The great American irony lies in recognizing how every morsel of its beauty is born out of the residue of its ugliness. Every freedom stolen by means of oppressing others. When we understand that America's sense of self is tethered to a perpetual violence toward Black folks, we will learn that the type of justice and change and transformation we seek requires for America to let go of herself. While well, such a letting go of is an act of vulnerability. It is also an act of surrender and sacrifice. I am not convinced that America has learned to be that unselfish. I am not convinced America thinks such a reckoning is worthwhile. End of quote. I'm just going to clap for my colleague because he said what I could not say. And in my final analysis of Black people, specifically Black Catholics, exercising their rhetorical agency and the Black prophetic tradition, I turn to just a few Black Catholic luminaries, both past and present. I have a few statements of their rhetorical agency from the Black prophetic tradition, moving from accommodating or excusing racism and injustice with the Catholic Church to having the temerity to speak boldly to the church about its complicity and perpetual perpetuation of 
great racial injustice. The man we honor, Augustus Tolton, said in 1889 to the Black Catholic Congress, Father Tolton declared, the Catholic Church deplores slavery, that of the mind and that of the body. She endeavors to free us from both. I was a poor slave boy, but the priests of the church did not disdain me. It was through the influence of one of them that I became what I am tonight. Sister Antona Mary Ebo, Franciscan sister of Mary from St. Louis, traveled to Selma, Alabama in 1965 to march and protest Black voters' suppression. Sister Antona stood before the press dressed in her full Franciscan traditional habit. Fearlessly, she stated, I am a Negro and very proud. I feel it a privilege to be here today. I might say that yesterday, being a Negro, I voted. And I'd like to come here today and say that every citizen, Negro as well as white, should be given the right to vote. That's why I'm here today. On April 18th, 1968, two weeks after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., in a published statement, the National Black Catholic Clergy Caucus accused the Catholic Church in the United States of being primarily, I quote, a white racist institution that has addressed itself primarily to white society and is definitely a part of that society, end of quote. They also stated that the church cannot effectively lead the black Catholic community if she is not willing to listen and learn from her black Catholic children. The National Black Catholic Clergy Caucus further asserted, asserted and I quote, within the ghetto, the role of the church is no longer that of spokesman and leader. Apart from a more spiritual role, direct spiritual role, the church's part must now be that of supporter and learner. That is a role that white priests in the black community have not been accustomed to playing and are not psychologically prepared to play, end of quote. So Sophia Bowman, servant of God as venerable Tolton said, they are the two that are on the path of sainthood who both address the Black Catholic Congress he being the first, it, it died for a while, and Sister Thea Bowman in 1987 said this, when we know who we are and claim the history, we claim the struggle, the pain, the challenge, the purpose, the journey, and the dream. We are who we are and whose we are because of all of our journeys, and the children that belong to our communities or enriched because of a pluralism that reflects life in a world that is pluralistic. Do we know all we can? Do we know all we can know of ourselves, of our history, of our arts, and of our experience, of our goals, and of our values, and the full range, what made us God's people? When we know and understand, then we can do what we need to do to help ourselves. And finally, in his book, Racial Justice in the Catholic Church, Catholic priest and moral theologian, Father Brian Massengale states, recall, and I argued that the key component of Black culture is the expectation of struggle, and that a core element of white culture is the presumption of dominance, that is, the presumption of being the norm or standard to which all others should conform. Now we can better understand the phrase white church culture and what black Catholics mean when we say that the Catholic church is a white institution. It entails more than the obvious fact that a Western European culture has shaped the culture of the Catholic church in the United States. What makes this a white church culture is deeper than the cultural roots of this liturgical music or rubrics. It is the presumption that these and only these particular cultural expressions are standard, normative, universal, and thus really Catholic, end of quote. As I take my seat, I say this, how could the African-American community for centuries endure the physical and psychological abuse of white supremacy and remain in their right mind. See, the Black folks got that. That's a Black idiom for remaining sane. 
For that matter, how do African Americans survive the resurgent, the horrific, the overt racism today? I submit that the answers to these questions are one and the same. Certainly, our African American ancestors and the assurance that God was with them through danger seen and unseen. And yet I believe that the soothing prophetic alternative reality provided by African American preachers confirmed for them that they are much more than what white people thought about them and said about them. The preacher's words gave them that inner spiritual, inner spiritual strength and over, to overcome any obstacle that came their way. Their ability to resist and remain resilient was derived from the preacher's prophetic promise that trouble don't last. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Maurice. If you were not stirred by this lecture, <laughs> then you need to check your pulse. Amen. I thank you, Father, Dr. Reverend <laughs> Maurice Nutt. We appreciate your words and your challenge um, to those that preach. And so we appreciate you on today. And we have a few minutes for some Q&A. Uh, Beyond, they got a mic, so somebody uh, Kurt right here has a. We can just let you kind of. Hand it don't need a mic. <laughs> they need it for Zoom. Father, you said earlier that we come to church uh, for healing, hope, community is communal. But I was listening for that one word. We come to church for answers, in light of all. I'm going to call it black genocide of our young people. How do you explain that kind of hope to them? How do you say, without saying, well, let go and let God? They're looking for some genuine answers of why I lost my son, my cousin, my grandson, my best friend. Answers come, Deacon, when you have a relationship with your people. When you really know them and you're concerned upon their needs, you're not just coming on Sunday morning to give a nice 10 or 15 minute homily. When you interact with them, it should influence your preaching. When you know the troubles they have seen, you're able to address them both in word and deed. And my assertion is this, some people can't speak about what they don't know about. And so it's about having that relationship, that, that familiarity. And I want to say just to extend on that a little bit, it's just that many Catholic priests and deacons are afraid to speak about justice, social justice issues in the pulpit, you know. And Pope Francis certainly reminded us that abortion is not the only social issue that we have in America. There are a lot of life life-challenging situations we deal with. Anyone else? Uh, thank you, Father Nutt. Um, to the point that you were saying, how do we challenge the church when many of us are very reluctant to do it, you know, because we get labeled Black radicals or, you know, in, in, in that particular vein? Because I know in Chicago, especially the Black Catholic Church in Chicago in the late 60s, early 70s, there was a true radical tradition in, in, in Black Catholicism. Right. So how do we get to that? How do we get to that Black unity mass and, 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 and you know, Father George Clemen and many of the congregations in the city back in those times to challenge, you know, bishops at that time who was not looking for the best interests of Black people? I, I answered it somewhat in my talk. It's about knowing what the Black rhetorical tradition is. It, it's the challenge. If we were to challenge some of the things in our history as African-Americans in the Catholic Church, baby, now is the time. Our Holy Father in all of his encyclicals have been leading the way. 
And if we begin to take on that, that mantle of speaking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, I mentioned you're not truly preaching. Jesus was radical. Jesus disrupted the powers to be of his day. Did he care about what they thought about him? What they said about him? And even when they crucified him, black folks say he never said a mumbling word. That, that's the challenge you have to do, that you make. Now, we have some booksellers outside that want to sell my book, and I certainly want it to be sold. So um, if there isn't, is there one urgent question? Okay, if not, I would like to call Sister Barbara up one more time. Sister Barbara, I would like to present to you a personal autograph copy as president of this institution, this wonderful theology of school and theology, school of theology and ministry. And I also put in the description, do you mind if I share it publicly? Because I, I want to, I, I, but, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna do it anyway. I shouldn't even put it says to Sister Barbara Reed OP. And I sincerely mean these words, sister. Thank you for inspiring me to love, live, and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Maurice. I'm glad to be here. I, I just have to comment. I couldn't help but notice that three of the women that you gave tribute to tonight are members of the Order of Preachers. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yes, they are. And um, I also want you to know that um, we're in the process of applying for a grant. There's a new initiative by the Lilly Endowment. I'm sure you know. Preaching. Compelling yeah. preaching. I think you have just given us a very good example why CTU is well positioned to continue to prepare compelling preachers <laughs> for our church. I Thank you, you for apply. being our poster child. For Amen. That. Yes, <laughs> you made me. CTU, like it or not, you made me. And I love it. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Again, thank you um, for that sermon that you gave us on today. We appreciate it. And we were truly transformed. Amen. So I just, you know, of course, you know, at the end of a service, we have some announcements. So on this Saturday, we have our Harambe. Again, this is the first time in three years that we are back together. And so we invite you, it's from noon to four here at CTU, and it's not too late to get your tickets. Uh, we also are, I have scholars today selling raffle tickets. Um, so if you wanna buy a raffle ticket from one of the scholars, please do so. Um, and we appreciate any support that we can get. Um, you know, as, as a scholarship program, we are always trying to, for one, um, encourage, especially our younger uh, generations, like our Kianda, he, she's one of our, she's our youngest scholar. And, 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 you know, encourage them to want to do ministry. And so, uh, and I say the young encourage the young. So, but anyway, so please support our Totem program on this weekend. Uh, we call this Totem Week. So we start with a lecture and then we have our Harambe. Um, on March the 7th, um, the experiences of Muslim and Christian African-Americans in today's United States, this is part two. Um, our um, Dr. Vanessa White had done part one uh, about back in December. Are you one, And she is one of the sponsors of that. That's gonna happen. Um, virtually, or is it virtually, virtually on um, March the 7th. Um, and so, and the, the speakers on this one is uh, Tia Noel Pratt, who is from Villanova um, University, and Amina uh, Beverly Aldine. Uh, she's a PhD from, um, I'm sorry, I don't, oh, here we go. She's a PhD professor emeritus of Islamic studies from DePaul University. So we appreciate that, that you know, the things that um, CTU has, we have a lot of events and programs that are educational, inspiring, and transforming. So by all means, take advantage of that. Um, so after uh, we get finished here, 
We have the book signing with Reverend, Reverend uh, Maurice, um, Down Deep in My Soul, an African-American Catholic Theology of Preaching. I thank um, Peter Cunningham and Steve Millis from the Bernadine Center for setting up that. And you can't get this book on Amazon right now. So I, I encourage you to buy the book. And if you didn't get, oh, number one, pre-sale. Oh, okay, number one, pre-selling and Catholic preaching. On, okay, great. And if you didn't get enough, Father Maurice will be teaching a summer at CTU class the week of June 20th through 23rd, Black Preaching and Evangelization on campus and via Zoom. So you can join that, sign up for that. Again, we thank you and wish and, and so happy that you joined us on today. Um, we also have recep reception outside in the pre-function area. So as you exit here, as you're getting your, your book, you can you know, partake in some refreshments. Thank you again and hope to see you on Saturday.